Hello everybody and welcome back to another mini-sode of How Did We Not Know That? I'm Nat and today I'm going to be starting a series of mini-sodes that are going to cover permanently inhabited U.S. territories. I recently finished an incredibly informative and very eye-opening book by Daniel Immerwar called How to Hide an Empire, and it goes into great detail about the history of U.S. territories and the American Empire. Literally every page I was asking myself, how did I not know that? So I wanted to share my research on currently inhabited U.S. territories with our listeners. So today I'm going to start off the mini-series by giving a brief overview of the history of Guam an island that's located in the Western Pacific in the region known as Micronesia. Guam is part of a cluster of islands known as the Mariana Islands, but it's technically separate from the Northern Mariana Islands, which I'll be covering later in this series. If you're looking for Guam on a map, you're gonna have to look really far from the continental US since Guam is located 6,000 miles from California. But if Guam is located so far away from the US, how and why did it become American soil? Let's start by looking back more than 4,000 years ago, when people arriving from Southeast Asia settled in the group of islands that would later be known as the Mariana Islands. These islands were occupied continuously over thousands of years by people who shared the same language and culture and would be called the Chamorro. They created a complex class-based matrilineal society that based itself on fishing and agriculture, and it had very little contact with people outside of the islands. All of this changed when, in 1521, Ferdinand Magellan arrived on the island and began 300 years of Spanish conquest. At first, Magellan decided that the islands weren't useful enough to Spain and pretty much ignored them. He did, however, spread their reputation as quote-unquote savages across Europe and named the area the Islands of Thieves. Because of this, other European empires had no interest in conquering the islands and while Spanish ships would make visits once in a while, the Chamorros lived in relative isolation for the next century. However, in 1668, Father San Vitores, an aggressive Spanish missionary, arrived in the Mariana Islands. San Vitores, like many other missionaries at the time, was very violent and had a tense relationship with the Chamorros. The final straw would be when he secretly baptized the infant daughter of a local chief, Matapang, against his wishes. This conflict resulted in San Vitores' death, which infuriated the Spanish. This was the turning point in the relationship between Spain and the Chamorros, and transformed the islands into a subjugated Spanish colony. The Spanish military quickly took over the islands, which led to a series of Spanish Chamorro wars that lasted 26 years. These wars brought new diseases to the islands and destroyed the Chamorro population. By the year 1700, only 10% of Chamorros remained, equating to roughly 5,000 people. After this, Spanish troops started to forcefully relocate Chamorros from the northern islands to Guam in order to control the population. In Guam, Chamorros were put into newly built villages and were forced to assimilate to Spanish culture. Today, the indigenous Chamorro language has the same traditional grammar structure, but more than half of its vocabulary comes from Spanish. Thousands and thousands of years of traditions, stories, and connections to the land were lost. Over the next century and a half, the Spanish maintained a relatively lazy rule over the islands. Then the U.S. steps in. In 1898, the U.S. defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War. This war is going to be covered in a future episode, so don't worry, you'll be able to hear all about it soon. Basically, what you need to know right now is that after the war ended, the U.S. was seized by the ideology of manifest destiny and wanted to expand its rule beyond the continental U.S. Guam was officially handed over from Spain to the U.S. in the Treaty of Paris in 1898. When U.S. ships arrived at Guam, the Spanish troops stationed there had been so isolated from the rest of the world that they had no idea that the two countries were at war. They literally thought the cannons being fired from U.S. ships were a salute. Once the misunderstanding was cleared up, the transfer between the two countries was peaceful and Spanish troops basically just left. And so if you're confused about why Guam is separate from the northern Mariana Islands, here's the story behind that. 
When Americans were negotiating with Spain about the territories they would be acquiring, they only asked about Guam and pretty much forgot to ask about the rest of the Mariana Islands and other islands in Micronesia. So Spain quickly sold them to Germany before the U.S. could realize their mistake. As a result, the U.S. takes Guam, Germany buys the other islands nearby, and a division is created between the Chamorros of Guam and the Chamorros of the Northern Mariana Islands. At first, the Chamorros of Guam were optimistic, or I guess as optimistic as you can be, and the families of power met to establish a legislature and were planning on creating a democratic and representative government, much like their new colonial power. However, they were surprised when Guam was instead placed under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of the Navy and essentially put under martial law. Instead of a democratically elected government, Guam was ruled by a series of military governors who had absolute authority over the island. But Chamorros were persistent in their pursuit of democracy. And in 1936, two delegates from Guam, Baltazar J. Bordayo and Francisco B. Leon Guerrero went to D.C. in order to petition for a Chamorro citizenship. Despite the fact that President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Congress were optimistic about the cause, the Navy ended up convincing the federal government to reject their petition. In their argument, the Navy cited the quote-unquote racial problems of the locality and said that, quote, These people have not yet reached a state of development commensurate with the personal independence, obligations, and responsibilities of United States citizenship, unquote. On December 7, 1941, a date which lives in infamy for Americans, Japanese forces bombed the naval base of Pearl Harbor. But what most Americans don't know is that four hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Guam was also bombed by Japanese forces. The island was seized by Japanese troops and was under Japanese occupation for over three years. More than 13,000 American subjects suffered from injuries, forced labor, forced march, or internment. 1,123 people died, but Americans from the mainland had no idea. When Japan surrendered to the Allied powers in 1945, the U.S. gained control over Guam again. And after World War II, the U.S. quickly expanded its military presence on the island as well as in the rest of Micronesia. The military seized ancestral lands from Chamorros, offering them compensation that was seen as insufficient by Chamorros if they received anything at all. Guam became a hub for American economic and commercial development. Military spending is currently the island's biggest industry, with tourism following it in second place. Today, the Department of Defense owns roughly 30% of Guam's land. Guamanians are U.S. citizens by birth, but they can't vote in presidential elections, and their representative to Congress is a non-voting member. But Guamanians have a very strong sense of patriotism that is a lot more visible than in other places in the mainland. People from Guam enlist in the U.S. military at a higher rate per capita than any state in the U.S. This means that Guamanians are risking their lives to protect U.S. national security and the American people, even though they can't even vote for the president that is overseeing these conflicts. The U.S. military bases on the island have been at the center of several political movements in Guam, but not everyone there resents it. A lot of locals believe that the military has improved the local economy through the creation of new jobs in construction, retail, and service industries. Many worry that if the military left, it would lead to economic turmoil. There have been many political movements that have pursued to either incorporate Guam as a state or liberate it from the U.S. Current events have brought Guam's special status as a territory into the spotlight. Right now, the U.S. military is planning on relocating the U.S. Marines base in Okinawa, Japan, to Guam. This new 2,000-acre large base would bring in more than 5,000 Marines and their families to the small island. Many people on the island are worried about the effects this new base will have on the local indigenous population and the environment. Additionally, in October 2018, Typhoon U2 struck several islands in the Pacific, including Guam. It was the biggest storm to hit U.S. soil since 1935, but it received very little media attention on the mainland. The typhoon destroyed around 3,000 homes and wreaked havoc on the island's infrastructure. The lack of attention and lack of concern from Americans meant that there were very little re relief efforts in order to help the island recover from this disaster. And finally, Guam's position as a U.S. military base has put the lives of the 162,000 people living in Guam at risk several times. 
A more recent example is on August 9, 2017, when North Korean leader Kim Jong-un threatened to drop a nuclear bomb on the island in order to destroy the base. Guam had a brief moment in the spotlight, and many Americans were surprised when they learned that the people of Guam are actually American citizens, and that Guam isn't just a military base, but it is also the home to hundreds of thousands of people. I personally think it's really shameful that Guam isn't talked about or isn't recognized by most Americans. I didn't even know it was a U.S. territory until college, and I actually talked about Guam a lot in my international relations classes, but we only ever talked about the island as a geopolitically strategic military base, not as a home to the Chamorro people and its culture and language, and we never discussed the island's history. A lack of awareness is pretty much the theme of this mini-series, and I hope listeners take the opportunity to continue learning about Guam, Chamorro culture and history, and other U.S. territories of the past and present, and share what they learned with others. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in part two of this mini-series when we discuss the Northern Mariana Islands. This has been an episode of How Did We Not Know That? If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. You can also follow us on all social media, including YouTube, at How Did We Not Know That? If you thought our podcast was low quality, we know. We thought so, too. Help us improve the podcast by contributing to our Patreon. Thank you for listening, and see you guys next week.